second scripture lesson for today comes from the book of Matthew, chapter 26, verses 36 through 45. It goes like this. Then Jesus went with his disciples to a place called Gethsemane. And he said to them, sit here while I go over there and pray. He took Peter and the two sons of Zebedee along with him, and he began to be sorrowful and troubled. Then he said to them, My soul is overwhelmed with sorrow to the point of death. Stay here and keep watch with me. Going a little farther, he fell with his face to the ground and prayed, My father, if it is possible, may this cup be taken from me, yet not as I will, but as you will. Then he returned to his disciples and found them sleeping. Couldn't you men keep watch with me for one hour? He asked Peter. Watch and pray so that you will not fall into temptation. The spirit is willing, but the flesh is weak. He went away a second time and prayed, My father, if it is not possible for this cup to be taken away unless I drink it, may your will be done. With that he came back and he again found them sleeping because their eyes were heavy. So he left them and went away once more and prayed for the third time, saying the same thing. Then he returned to the disciples and said to them, are you still sleeping and resting? Look, the hour has come, and the Son of Man is delivered into the hands of sinners. Please pray with me. Dear God, let these words settle deep into our hearts so that we can know and follow your will and not our own. Well, last week, I had the opportunity to go to the next church conference in Seattle, Washington. Now, I had never been to Seattle before, and I was looking forward to seeing the city while meeting and learning and worshiping with Presbyterians as we talked about the future of the church in the world and the future of the Presbyterian denomination in particular. The conference met in downtown Seattle at the First Presbyterian Church of Seattle, one of the first churches in the city, founded in 1869. Now, the history of this church is that in 1901, they called the young and the very charismatic and very conservative Reverend Mark Matthews there from Georgia. This fiery preacher was anti-women's right to vote anti-alcohol, anti-organized labor, anti-immigrant, and very anti-Semitic. He was a frequent visitor to Woodrow Wilson's White House and was widely and openly quoted as saying that Jews constitute a great menace to our country. Nevertheless, his Seattle church grew exponentially under his leadership. And by the time that he ended in his ministry, by dying in the, basically in the pulpit in 1940, Seattle First Presbyterian Church had grown to 8,818 members. They had 26 satellite churches and Sunday schools. And the church itself was governed by a session of 110 men. It was by far the biggest church in the Presbyterian denomination and thought by some at the time to be one of the biggest churches in the United States. The church was so large they installed an exercise track on the roof of the church building. They had hearing assistance devices in every pew and they even had their own private radio station. Seattle First Presbyterian continued through the decades to be a huge megachurch with thousands of members even though the 26 satellite churches eventually all broke off with their own leadership. 
1969, they built this huge sanctuary that seats about 600 people. It was an edgy example of the 1960s brutal architecture. It had thick bunker-like cement pillars that were painted white and were floating in the air. The stained glass windows, instead of being low and accessible to the people, were really high up on the second and third story. This was the sanctuary that we were worshiping in for the next church conference. But not everything had gone well for the Presbyterian Church in Seattle. In 2012, the married co-pastors had tried to remove the church from the Presbyterian denomination without following the approved separation procedures. The two pastors and their group of following members sued to retain control over the downtown Seattle church building and grounds. As the denomination acted to remove the co-pastors from their pastoral positions for not following presbytery polity and procedures, the clergy couple also lost in Seattle court, and members started leaving the conflict in droves. The Seattle First Presbyterian Church today, after this major split, is now only about 100 members. It's about the same size as our congregation, North Kent Presbyterian. And a group of about 30 people gather to worship each Sunday in the chapel of the building, which is about the same size as this room. And the huge 600-seat sanctuary sits empty week after week. The building itself is showing signs of its age and all of the consequences of deferred maintenance. There are mouse traps in the corners of every classroom. There are lots of broken light fixtures throughout the building. And in the bathrooms, there is evidence of plumbing issues that had not been properly addressed. But the congregation is not dissolving. Currently, they are housing 100 homeless people in the church basement every day. And recently, they have done the brave decision to vote to sell their church building. It sits on a full city block in downtown Seattle. The appraised value of Seattle First Presbyterian Church property is $58 million. Ooh. So the Seattle First Presbyterian congregation of 100 people is now trying to discern what God's will could be for such a huge lump sum of money. God's will. What is it? That little phrase brings up so many questions when we just rattle it off in the Lord's Prayer and zip right by it. Was it God's will that the largest Presbyterian church in the country has dwindled in size from over 8,000 down to 100 people? Was it God's will that this particular congregation split as they tried to leave the PCUSA denomination? Is it God's will that the huge Seattle First Presbyterian Church building and grounds should now be sold? And that that $58 million should be used in other ways than to fix up the plumbing in an underutilized building. Thinking about God's will also brings up a bunch of other kinds of questions of things that happen around us and that are in the news every day. Was it God's will for someone to get into a car accident? Was it God's will for someone to get cancer? And what about death? Was it God's will that someone died yesterday from a terrorist rifle or perhaps from being a victim of domestic violence? No, I think it's rather clear that if we say that God's will causes everything to happen, that it removes all human responsibility and therefore any possibility of our very real sin. And such a proposal clearly isn't biblical. We are all called to repent of our sins, to turn our lives over to God. We are called to follow and to be disciples of Jesus Christ every day of our lives. And we are called to love God 
and love others while loving ourselves. In my view, it is that exactly by doing this that we are doing the will of God. Loving God is something that God never forces on humanity, but calls each of us to do through tears of love, to come and be in relationship with the God of the universe. God calls each of us to live in harmony with our neighbor, both the ones next door and the ones around the world, to live in harmony with the creation all around us, and to balance all of that with our love and our care for ourselves in like measure. To put it more simply, I believe that the will of God is this, to increase the amount of love in the world. Here's another story from Seattle to illustrate the point. On the Thursday morning that I was scheduled to head to the airport to fly back to Michigan from Seattle, I decided that I was going to get a big breakfast in the hotel restaurant. You know how sometimes it's tricky to fit one of those meals in during layovers. And while I was fortunate in the Minneapolis airport on my way out, I knew that my layover on the way back was a little shorter. So after I had packed my bags in my room that morning, I went down and I settled into one of those comfy chairs in the nearly empty restaurant of the Executive Pacific Hotel. And I ordered an omelet and some fruit. I was just sitting there minding my own business, checking my email on my phone, when a sudden ruckus exploded out on 4th Street. There were big windows on the lower level of the restaurant that looked outside to the street. And myself and the two servers in the room, we all stopped what we were doing, and we turned to look outside at what was happening. One professionally dressed woman with a beautiful black leather satchel was screaming at another professionally dressed woman who was standing near her on the sidewalk. She was waving her arm and her black bag swaying in the air and looked like she was so angry she was about to hit the woman she was yelling at. The local bus was near them on the street with its door open and the bus driver peering out at the two women, obviously waiting to see if someone was going to come and get on board the bus. Several other people who had been randomly walking by on the sidewalk had stopped to watch. And the two delivery men stepped out of the hotel kitchen and into the restaurant to see what was going on outside. As her yelling continued, the two delivery guys started gleefully chanting, Fight! 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 <laughs> Just like teenage boys in a high school hallway would. They got kind of a dark look from the server and they stopped. While we sitting or standing in the restaurant could not make out all of the words of what was happening with the screaming on the sidewalk, it was very clear that the one woman had somehow felt extremely offended by the other. She ranted on for a bit, and then she concluded her remarks with a very loud obscenity, one that even we inside the restaurant could clearly hear. And then she stalked away down the sidewalk. The other woman, the one who had been verbally attacked but had said little or nothing, stood gaping and shocked on the sidewalk. This was clearly not what she had expected to happen on a Thursday morning on her way to work, especially not on a public street corner near the corner of 4th and Spring Street in downtown Seattle. And that is when I saw love increase in the world. One of the bystanders came and took the shocked woman's arm and motioned toward the bus. When she nodded, he escorted her to the still waiting vehicle. And another young woman with a backpack, I'm guessing she was a student, handed the shocked woman what looked to be like a bus ticket. The woman who had been verbally assaulted just moments before was now being treated like royalty by random Seattle lights on the sidewalk. She got on the bus, which quickly and gently pulled away, and with a simple nod to each other, the Good Samaritan people of Seattle got back to the regularly scheduled Thursday morning, and they all walked away. Mm -hmm. Now what had just happened there? Was the 
offense that started the entire altercation, the will of God? Did those two women know each other before the fight? Or did something just happen between two strangers on the street? Was the one woman justified in her anger and her verbal outlash at the other? Without a trial and evidence of the facts, we as the random observers will never know. But there probably was a human sin somewhere in the tangle, either by an actual offense or an overreaction to an unintended slight. We humans are so broken in both big and small ways, and frequently our sharp and untempered edges cut the other people around us. And for that, we definitely need to apologize and ask both God and others for forgiveness. But it is only because of that human brokenness in the world that we actually have the opportunity to actually choose to follow and to do the will of God. My friends, we have the opportunity, because of human brokenness, to bind up the brokenhearted, to help the sick and the poor. We are called to stand up against the powerful, and their deeds of injustice, and to make the world a better place for the least of these in the whole world. My friends, it is my belief that the will of God for us as human beings is to continually bring the love of God to fuller expression in the world, in all the everyday dealings of our life, to let the light of God's love spread to the darkest corners of human experience, to transform the world to be a place where God's will of love is done to the greatest extent possible. May God's will ever be done more fully and completely in your life and in mine. Amen.